my next question would be um so players coming from the interior are not the only type of player Uruguay is known for since I know you uh, precisely talked about the legend the legendary strikers they had over time. Uh, could you briefly yeah. name us just a few of them of our own? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I have um, a list of, I think, the, some of the key ones. So, um, yeah, you're right. Like, so you're saying, so what you're saying is that you're saying it's, it's you know, Uruguay produces, like they're almost known for strikers and over the years, right? I'd say defenders as well. Um, so a lot of this starts from the early years with uh, you have Angel Romano. He won uh, six Copa Americas. Um, he started for Uruguay in 1924 when they won the Olympic tournament. And he, I think he's the, the player who scored the most official goals against Brazil. So he was already like one of Uruguay's first initial exceptional strikers. Then you had Hector Scarone, who, you know, some people in South America see as some people would argue like one of the best players of his generation in the 1920s into the early 30s. So, you know, Hector Castro, he was 1930 World Cup hero, essentially played without his arm. He is called the, the armless Castro. So, you know, these players, you know, they have a, there's a long tradition of basically a uh, very headstrong, strong personality, physically strong. And the idea of, of it's a striker that really doesn't stop sacrificing themselves for the team. And I've, cause I've, I've actually, you know, I've thought about this a lot. Like, why is it? So, you know, I'm naming players, Diego Forlan, Luis Suarez, Cavani, Darwin Nunez now coming up. You had Fernando Morena. He's not very well known in Europe, um, but he was... Recoba. Recoba as well, Francesco Lee as well. Although he was a really striker, but but then again, mm. Suarez also plays deep as well. So really, what mm. is a striker? I don't know if when I think of a striker in terms of like a pure number nine, I think of yeah. like Benzema maybe. But but yeah, uh, yeah. Well, even even Suarez too. If you ever watch him at Liverpool, he played very deep. He was almost like a midfielder, then a winger, then a striker. It's very mm. you know changing. But um, you know, I did notice something interesting this week when I was watching Liverpool versus Benfica. The English announcer kept mentioning, but it's been a surprise. Like, wow, look at Darwin. He's coming back to defend a corner. He's coming back to the, to, to play as a winger, like a wing back to defend, and then he's running back. And he was really amazed by that. And I remember thinking, oh, but that's so normal for Uruguayans to do. That's like the most normal thing. So my theory is that number one, you know, partly it is the whole culture of you know building headstrong. Uh, players as children who can, you know, uh, sort of play with a lot of pressure. But um, I also think that I noticed that Uruguayan players like to differentiate themselves in the market. So they like the idea that, oh, you bought a Uruguay. Well, you know, he's going to give everything because these guys are kind of crazy and they really feel football. And I've actually seen players mention that as well. It's like they'll arrive to a club in France and they'll say, well, you know, I'm going to try to show that Uruguayan, you know, uh, like style that we play, the all out, whatever. So one of the things is that, you know, we praise a lot, but we try to have our strikers do, although I think it's crazy because, you know, physically this stuff is killer. But basically it's the idea of what Cavani does. And I think you've seen Cavani. Like Cavani will, you know, attack a corner, then he'll chase the guy back all the way to the to the other end. Then he'll play as a wing back marking. Then he'll be as a number 10 and then a strike and all in like two minutes. And, you know, the idea is that we love that kind of player because it shows how much sacrifice he's giving and et cetera, et cetera. So, like I said, it's 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 a bit of it in, in a sense that I think, you know, we have that pride that the players should play with this very, you know, a lot of, I don't know, a lot of emotion, passion. I don't know. There, there's a lot to it, a lot of uh, emotion, a lot of, like I said, there's a spiritual component to Uruguayan football that I think goes understated mm-hmm. sometimes. But again, as well, I think that there is an actual practical value to this as well, because suddenly, you know, you have clubs turning their heads like hey look is that guy that guy's a striker but he can also you know he won't he won't complain about running back and defending you know he does it for free and he's glad to do it oh my god yes get this guy so like i said it's it's a little bit of both right like i said the uh there's a spiritual component but again logically it also makes sense as well and even though there's a lot of sacrifice like i said as children they're kind of bred the players to you know you have to leave there's a saying in European football that the sky blue should look blue by the end of the match because of the sweat, basically. So it's an old, old saying, but it's always mentioned. 
So, you know, the idea is that, yes, this is always prevalent in the minds of the players, even when they're competing at club level or international level as well, right? So, but yeah, I know you, you mentioned uh, other players. So, like I said, Fernando Moreno was one of the Benito's all-time greatest. Actually, he's the all-time Copa Libertadores top scorer. So we're talking about, yeah, there is a, there's a nice, you know, there's a nice uh, history of mm-hmm. your white strikers. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, like I said, there's, there's a lot of reasons why each individual, I think, might have succeeded. Um, but, you know, if I were to generalize... Uh, I would say that the, the the spiritual component as well, uh, as well as psychological, is, is a big influence in producing these types of players, basically. And even nowadays, La, La Celeste's young generation is filled with this type of players, with strikers like you mentioned, Darwin Nunez, but also uh, there's also Agustin Alvarez Martinez, Matias oh, yeah, Deso, yeah. Maxi yeah. Gomez, the, uh, in, as well as Facundo Torres, a more skill, skillful version of them. And I yeah. found a possible a possible explanation on why you why you produced so many top strikers in a video of journalist uh, Roman Molina. You you'll be able to let me know what you think about it. So this guy met some coaches. Uh, Edinson Cavani had as a kid for for the writing on his of his book on, uh, on El Matador, yeah. and they told him uh, his finishing in the box might precisely have to do with the bumpy pitches he used to play on. In his childhood, these, these so-called portrayals might therefore be the reason why uh, Cavani and Suarez have such a, a good vo- volley technique, for for instance. But I'm I'm not sure everyone is playing long balls and switches of play in Uruguay. So just because of the pitch, right? So <laughs> you you might have already seen. You know, you, you you told you you play. You, you've already played uh, in Uruguay, so maybe you. You know these so-called uh, portrayers. Uh, maybe you can confirm this theory. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, okay. Well, the thing is, um, the name uh, so portreros that actually comes from it from it's mostly an Argentinian mm-hmm. saying actually. So it comes from the word potro, which is basically like where the horses are bred. So there's a lot of like you know dirt and mud, and it's very uneven and mud muddy. So in a way, to to even call a football pitch that it is in reference to you know the bumpy pitches i don't think it's that bad in uruguay anymore for example they the um, okay so the, the pitches do influence and you know uruguayan players have said that playing in bad pitches has obviously motivated them and whenever they do play in good pitches it's a lot more simple so it's like you know they get used to the bad and then when they go to the good they'll, they might have an advantage but i don't know um, i did a little bit of research on this actually and actually i even spoke to a few people who have grown up playing in uruguay throughout their careers even playing on the youth team of pinero i called a friend yesterday about this and the idea was basically that no it's not that i mean For example, even though this word is Argentinian, it's still used in Argentina, even though most people grow up with futsal in their development. So in Uruguay, even though they don't have futsal as much, it's still done in grass. I think that the youth fields are actually fine in a sense. Mostly, I think when they say portreros, it's mostly in reference to street football. To the idea that in Uruguay, I mean, they really are playing everywhere. They're playing in the beaches. But I remember, I remember, I mentioned to you that French coach. Um, I think it's correct. I'm actually already had it here. Uh, Pierre. Oh, anyways, I have, oh Pierre Saratia. He actually says in his interview that when he goes downtown, he's amazed. He's, he'll find a small patch of grass. There's kids playing. Over there's the beach, there's people playing. There's a field, there's people playing. A tiny version of the field, there's people playing. So there's a lot of variety, I think, in terms of where you can play. And maybe that does cause a bit of a, a benefit, um, you know? I mean, it, I don't know. Because in my view, I always assume that all over South America, they have these advantages. They have these, you know, areas to play. But then, I don't know. Sometimes I think, well, I think I grew up here in Toronto, in Canada. And honestly, I cannot imagine someone just playing soccer or football in the middle of the pitch or middle of the street at this point, it, it would just be very limited. But in Uruguay, it's much more made. I don't know, it's, like, it's almost like the city is made to allow for football spaces. It's very interesting in that sense. So I wouldn't say that it's actually the, you know, the, the like I said, the portre, por, portreros, the, the, those types of fields are what give Cavani or Suarez that advantage. I don't think that's what it is. Even asking players, they said they felt it wasn't as well. Um, but but like I said, the I can at least mention where that um, tradition comes from, where that word comes from. And essentially, yeah, like they, they might call it Potreros now, you know, in reference to something that, you know, like I said, it came from Argentina. And maybe if a field is a little bit bumpy, they'll say, oh, look, we're playing in the Potreros today or whatever. I don't even think they call that anymore, actually. In Uruguay, they started calling the fields the semicheros, which is like the, uh, 
So it shows where you you plant. You plant something. Right? Yeah, exactly. So there's the seed planters. So it's like even you know, like I said, it's is even the name, the old saying has started to change a little bit to to show that it's not really about I think bad fields creating these extraordinary players. If it was the case, then I think you know right now Germany, Escola, they would have to start bulldozing their pitches, destroying everything just to, you know because apparently that's the formula. But I don't think it is personally. <laughs> Okay, and and on Cavani, uh, I found some I found out something very interesting about him. He he seems to have played as a kid for both Club Nacional and Club Atlético Peñarol. Uh, Uruguay is the two giant clubs, even if even if not in Montevideo, where this team uh, these two teams are, are based. In in fact, both clubs seems to ha seem to have a, a local club in Salto, where Cavani is from. So, I wanted to ask you if these two giants are known for having football schools uh, around the country because in the case of El Matador, this, this could have been a reason why he, he made it to the professional world, uh, coming precisely from the interior and being scouted by... <laughs> well, okay, so the, okay, one of the things is I looked this up and I, I actually had to call someone else about this as well. And they, with, uh, from, so this is in reference to what someone told me, but the idea was that these are not official clubs affiliated with Nacional and Peñarol. So they, they just named, so it's not like, I mean, it's not like here, you know, in, in North America. Or they have played Uruguay. Well, they well that's... Uruguay. That's well. That those are those are the real professional first division clubs. Yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, no, I know. Those ones. But in terms of like in Salto, for example, um, if you see Nacional Peñarol, it's usually just an organization that has a, like an, a fan or affiliation historically with Nacional Peñarol, but they're not like actually uh, part of the organization. So it's not like, and for some reason, you know, here in Canada, for example, if if a small school opened up and called themselves a Toronto Maple Leafs, I would guarantee they would be sued within a week and torn down immediately or, or told to change the name. But in Uruguay, it's very, I don't know, it's just, like I said, they're not, the companies are not privatized, the clubs, um, there is just a more, you know, it's just allowed, accepted in a sense. So it's not like Cavani or Suarez, you know, they... You know, because you're asking about how was it that they could have, uh, you know, gone into the professional system. One of the ways that I found that Uruguayan players get called up from the youth from youth clubs like these, you know, Bobby Football equivalents, Nacional Peñarol, even etc., is that usually, let's just say Nacional, let's just say Peñarol right now, they'll pull out like a radio ad or an internet ad saying open tryouts uh, next Saturday at 1 p.m. in Los Aromos, right, where, our, where we train. So you'll actually have thousands of like kids kids come from all over montevideo and you'll actually have a lot of them come from the interior like they'll actually have buses organized to bring maybe 350 kids that will stay for a week in montevideo so suarez and Cavani had that experience as well so what happens is once they go the best players from the interior get transferred to montevideo then they can be seen then they can be scouted so one of the yeah the interesting thing is, is everything kind of does end in montevideo like you know in a sense um, but yeah, it's uh, it's not that, like I said, C Cavani played in like an official affiliate of Nacional and Peñarol. He just kind of played in a club. They just call the clubs something like that. Um, to give you an example, I, I don't know the name my friend actually mentioned to me. About a block away from one of the professional clubs called Danubio, there's a Bobby football team. And they essentially wear Danubio's colors. But Danubio wears all white with a black sort of river plate uh, Peru, you know, uh, cross band, right? The Bobby Football Club wears the opposite. So it's all black with white instead. And Danubio doesn't care. <laughs> They're like, absolutely, yeah, it's fine. And in fact, Danubio will actually often send scouts because it's a block away to see if there's any interesting players coming out of the Bobby Football Club. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it's it's very much either, it's because I, if I hear in North America, at least, and I think it's like that in Europe, they will actually send scouts out. But in Uruguay, it's a lot more as well that the players will go to the club. They'll have open tryouts. Like okay. Yeah. Because I asked the these clubs were affiliate, but <laughs> Thank you for for your insight. Uh, I've learned no, something here, yeah. and now I'd like to. Oh, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. And now I'd like to, to talk a bit more in depth about these two Uruguayan giants, starting with Peñarol. Some of the former academy players include uh, Cristian Cebolla Rodriguez, uh, yes. as well as youngsters Darwin Nunez, uh, Brian Rodriguez, Facundo Torres, Federico Valverde. Um, Facundo Pelistri, Naitan Mendes, as well as Diego Rossi. And the youngster have just won the U20 Copa Libertadores two months ago. So can we say Peñarol is now becoming a, a talent uh, a talent factory? 
It's an interesting uh, thing that's been happening recently with Peñarol. And in fact, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people are even saying that it's incredibly, if Peñarol had kept these players for like three years, they would have challenged the Copa Libertadores, like for sure, with only homegrown. Like we're talking to like, to, to even think that they could have defeated Flamengo, who has like a team that's worth like a hundred million more. You know what I mean? So it's, it's really, really incredible that, you know, that does occur. Now, one of the things that I realized, so when I did research on this, there actually was, so the idea is this, yeah, every club at Uruguay is investing a lot on the uses, but the reason why Peñero was especially successful is because they had a very particular scout. Apparently this guy was like a genius and I, I didn't get his name. I should have gotten his name as well, but I, I read about it and I even talked to someone about it who explained it to me. And the but idea was they, that, yes, as he left uh, Peñarol, you you said he, yes. So the have... big, yes, yes, yes. So the big controversy is that last, like before this season started. So actually, this was I think last August. Nacional took him. Apparently, they just outbid him. So this was actually, and I remember it was like front page. I'm like, why? Why are they making such a big deal out of, out of a scout? And it was only until Peñarol won the news uh, Libertadores, and then they mentioned like, yeah, this scout was like integral in discovering all of these players. And I was like, wow, no wonder this was such a big story. So apparently the idea is that, yeah, this scout is now working for Nacional and he was integral in discovering, at least in the youth system, um, from, through Bobby Fubo, through the under 15s, under 16s, et cetera, and Peñarol. Yeah, all these uh, talented players, legitimately, like I was, you know, Albert Martinez, Peliti, like, you know, officially the one who takes credit for bringing them up to first division, I think was, uh, so for example, I think for Facundo Torres was Diego Forlan. Forlan was the manager for a very brief amount of time, I think barely four months on Peñarol. But yeah, he was the one who brought him up. But the guy who like discovered the sort of the, the pure talent from the children's game was the scout. So the idea is that, yeah, but Peñarol was benefiting tremendously from him. And apparently, well, the, the big twist in the matter is that Nacional um, you know, acquired his services recently. So, you know, it would be interesting to see now if we see Nacional just sort of explode ahead of Peñarol in terms of youth development. That would be fascinating. And I think maybe that would actually prove it. If the new guy, this guy could have the success in Nacional that he did with Peñarol, I think now in an interview, if you were to ask me again in a year, I would say, okay, we know the X factor now. It was definitely this guy. But, it, but it, you know, if you're wondering about have Peñarol done anything extraordinary, like anything... No, I mean, they're they're investing as much as anyone does. And honestly, with youth football, it's kind of like a roulette. You know, you get lucky or you don't. Even if you invest a lot, sometimes nothing comes from it. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I, I was thrilled that Bayonne won the uh, Libertadores. They've even intelligently contacted UEFA and set up the first ever intercontinental cup between the Euro, the Champions League winner, who is going to be decided apparently next month, and Peñero, and it's happening in June. I'm like... It's incredible, like just the the, the forced thought, the sight to like to think of something this quickly, right? So, anyways, but to answer your your main main question, uh, yeah, it's uh, it seems to be the scout was integral, but also there is the aspect of there's a lot of investment coming in now, more more than ever before. So that just strengthens the the rival the rivalry between uh, Peñarol and and Club, oh, yeah. Club Nacional even more. And oh. uh, precisely talking about um, Club Nacional, they also won the U20 Copa Libertadores, but uh, a few years ago, I think it was in uh, 2018. And the list of, of their former academy players isn't bad either. <laughs> Among them, we, we have Diego Lugano, uh, Rui Suarez, Rodrigo Ventancur, Matias Viña, and Matias uh, Oliveira, yeah, uh, who right. was now playing for for Getafe. Yeah, now, right. Well, I, I've just read many of the youngsters already joined a, a better league recently, so um, they, they, they seem to, to have a, a good uh, generation as well, but uh, two of them went to Brazil, uh, whereas two others signed respectively for Juventus and Atletico Madrid's reserve team. It sadly looks like it will always become more difficult for Uruguayan clubs to, to keep the youngsters for one for, yeah. for more than one season or for even just one half season with the first team. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. It's sort of the uh the tragic reality, I think, of South American football. Essentially, if you win, you have your team torn apart. One of my best friends, he's from Cali in Colombia, and their team, Deportivo Cali, recently won the league. Massive, massive everything. They lost like seven starters. And, you know, although they're doing okay in the Copa Libertadores, like bottom of the table. So their reward 
for winning the league was essentially now you're horrible and you're a terrible team. Imagine if you know Chelsea wins the league and they lose their whole team. It's it's unthinkable, right? You, no, you get more players now because the team is good. The thing is, yeah, in Uruguay it's the same. Peñarol um, lost. I, it's unrecognizable the team compared to the team that won the league a few a uh, few months ago. They lost maybe six key starters who are doing amazing in their clubs now. Palmeiras, Piqueres. They went to the Copa Sudamericana semifinal convincingly, and they could have gone to the final. They had a very good team. And yeah, they all left. Well, most of the stars left. If I, I would think Canovio, he went to uh, a Brazilian club, Paranaense. The thing is, there's a few fears in South America. Um, number one is that the fear that your player is going to lose value. So you have to sell them as quickly as possible. I see this all the time, by the way, whenever I go to uh, watch football shows in Uruguay. they Last week, they mentioned that apparently a year ago in the Sudamericana, uh, Agustin Alvarez Martinez was worth $20 million. And now he's had a run of a gold drought. Now he's apparently gone down to like $8 million. And they're like, we just lost $12 million because we didn't sell him right there. You know what I mean? So there's that fear. It's like, how how long will this good run go on for? Are we losing now? Um, also, the players, the players know that careers are short. So they don't come politely asking. Like, they want to leave. Like, if there's an offer for Boca Juniors, they, they, they'll make like 10 times more in Boca. Than, well, maybe not the national piano. They do make pretty well. But still, the idea is that these guys know this is my one chance to go to Europe. If it's not me, it's the next guy or the guy from the smaller club. So I need to take this opportunity to go to wherever right the Liga, um city out wherever so you know it's it's you know it's i don't know it's it's a reality um the players i feel that you know they do love the clubs you know growing up in uruguay national and Bader are more like cultural institutions they're not just clubs they're like actually part of the you know the, the daily life there but again the reality economically as well is that yeah these guys you know they have to ensure their futures the families and sometimes yeah it's it's almost luck if a uruguayan club can hold on to a, a crew, group of players for like seven months and fight for libertadores basically you know i think the last team that did really well was 2016 national were a penalty away from beating boca juniors and going to the semifinals and they lost, and that was it. The team immediately was, you know, d- destroyed, torn apart. But the team was good. The team was really good, actually. Uh, they had a lot of even internationals and everything, and you know. But like I said, it's it's like that luck. You have to kind of hold on to the team, and it's very frustrating for sure. You know, um, it's something that I think you know depends on the market. Uh, but a year ago, I think when or two years ago when COVID first hit, I remember that all the European clubs kind of closed their, their, you know, they weren't buying anything. So I remember at the time it was like, whoa, look, this guy's staying for another year. It was like exciting, you know. People were mentioning that. But again, it's very dependent on how is the market doing in Europe. You know, does anyone want you in Dubai? It all depends really on, on what everyone else's interests are, sadly. And nowadays, uh, a lot of European players trying join first uh, the MLS before going to to Europe and yes. uh, but it might it might maybe change uh, as as there is a club that that, that might might raise uh, uh, in a few years or, or that might might even be raising uh, actually right now uh, since new city football group club uh, Montevideo City Torque seems to be interested in in developing young players as well and they signed uh, two highly rated youngsters from uh, Club Nacional in these recent years, with one of them, Santiago Rodriguez, already having joined affiliate club uh, New York City. So how is this project looking like now? And how is it perceived in, in the country? Uh, I mean, from the other, other clubs, uh, obviously negatively, right? Well, actually, I think it's been only negative in a banter sense. So I, I think it's been a huge, a big success, actually. And I think people are generally seeing this as a very positive thing. Um, the only negative I find is the fans, you know, they'll banter, they'll joke around on Twitter. It's like, you know, you don't even have, you didn't exist two years ago, or you didn't have, you don't even have more than 10 fans for real, et cetera, et cetera. But in, in general, you know, what they've done, Torque, so they are, yes, they're owned by the Citigroup. I believe Citigroup owns, they own, let's see, New York uh, FC. They own Yokohama Marinos in Japan. I think they own, well, obviously Man- Manchester City and, I don't know, and Torque. But there's another club in there. Oh, Australian League. I forget which one. One of the Sky Blue. Yeah, I think Blue. Oh, and yes. Girona, Girona as well. In, in oh, no way. Okay. Wow. That's okay. It's interesting. Yeah. They... <laughs> Over in City FC. Yes. 
So, yeah, no, uh, the thing is, you know, what have they done? Well, they brought state-of-the-art facilities into Uruguay. If you see their training pitch, it's gorgeous. They just even made a whole new clubhouse. It's absolutely stunning. I mean, I think it literally rivals Nacional and Pinheiros, and it's like right away they just showed up. Um, they're playing great football as well. Like, the fact that you have a third power now that is, like, going to be there for hopefully forever bothering the big two I think it's very exciting because it makes the, the league much more exciting. They're playing very nice football. Like I can actually turn on a Torque game and appreciate it. It's very recently they lost in shootout to Barcelona of Guayaquil of Ecuador in for the Copa Sudamericana on penalties. And they played, they were wonderful. Like it wasn't, you know, a uh Uruguayan performance where they're, you know, grinding out the result and trying to no, no, no. They were like playing as equals against Barcelona, like a very, very wealthy team in Ecuador. So, you know, the, the thing is, you know, the, the project is growing. It's no noticeably growing. And recently, I think it was about a month ago, I found a tweet saying that Manchester United wanted to now follow suit. And they were looking into actually investing in Uruguay, maybe buying a club. So it, I think people are noticing internationally that this is working, that, um, you know, essentially the Uruguayan player is not valued highly in terms of financially. So you can get like a good quality player for like you know, pretty low amount, like six, seven million. And like I said, these, uh, you know, uh, recently, like I told you, the, this Chinese company contacted me like six months ago. About a week ago, the president of the Uruguayan Federation, he said, Ignacio Lonzo, said that a lot of companies have contacted from Asia to invest in teams following Turkey. So now you're having, because of the World Cup, I think it's gotten a little more attention in Uruguay. But still, it's like, I think this is a sign that it's been so successful that now we're seeing international interest. So I think that's not an accident. So there must be something to it. And like you said, yeah, the uh, one of the biggest, I think, successful stories was uh, Santiago Rodriguez, who was essentially transferred from Turkey to another club that they own, which was New York FC, New York City FC. Mm -hmm. And he's been doing really well there, right? He's been doing amazing there. So, you know, we're seeing now, like the project is actually moving and constantly growing as well. So I know it's, it's a very exciting time, actually, I think, in terms of what's happening in Uruguay. And Turkey is almost like, the, you know, they're the revolutionary. They're the first one to, to attempt this. And yeah. So far, you know what? We'll we'll see where it goes, but the, the looks of it is that you know what the investment has paid off and continued investment is coming. So it looks like good things so far. Mainly, okay, I would say. And is the squad made uh, mainly of Uruguayan players, or is it just, or do they scout in the whole South America? They do, they do. They, they even have a Chilean player who's excellent. I forget, his name. I forget his name now, but they have a Chilean player. They have a few internationals. Well, not internationals, okay. specifically internationals, but they have players from other parts of South America. Because I, I, I remember watching the game recently against Barcelona. And uh, yeah, when I looked at the, the lineup, maybe three of the players are four from, four from abroad. So like I said, you know, these are the same people who are investing in this and they saw talent abroad. But there's an Argentinian player as well. I had to check the whole roster, but I remember even last year seeing multiple players from abroad. So yeah, it's not just here at at all. Not mm -hmm. just here um, Okay. You know, yeah, it's a little bit of everything. I mean, there, there are other nationalities present for sure. It's a bit like uh, Red Bull Bragantino in Brazil. And they also scouted. Yeah, and actually, the, these are the two um, the two um, big companies in in world football: uh, Red yeah. Bull versus City Football Group. And yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. Uh, but well, look at, yeah, uh, there is still, for example, um, so the, 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 there's quite a controversy around uh, Red Bull because they, they changed the. the uh, they changed uh, every logo uh, and they rebrand uh, the name of the team. So that that's way more contra uh, controversial. Uh, yeah. As most of, uh, for example, Girona and their and their city football group, they they still own own the club. In um, it's not a full own. Uh, the the club is not fully owned by by city football group, and they they still have their crest and and the colors, and that's that's something. Uh, I, I appreciate it, uh, I have to say. So, 